This is Michael Woodward, and this is Season 2, Episode 43 of the JumbleThink Podcast. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Welcome to the Jumble Think Podcast, a podcast focused on telling the stories of dreamers, makers, innovators, and influencers. Along the way, we'll give you some tips and ideas how you can chase your own big ideas and dreams and change the world around you. Our guest on today's episode is Tom Poland. More about Tom in a moment. Next week on the podcast, our guests are CEO and founder Mary Shores and jazz musician Eric Reed. It's going to be a super fun week of guests and the 4th of July, so make sure you check out next week's episodes. Now let's jump into today's episode with Tom Poland. Hey there, welcome to the Jumble Think Podcast. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host and so glad you've chosen to join us for today's episode with Tom Poland. Before we get rolling on today's episode, I want to encourage you, wherever you like to listen to podcasts, click the subscribe button on the Jumble Think Podcast. If you like iTunes or Apple Podcasts or Spotify, we've made it even easier. If you swing on over to jumblethink.com slash iTunes or jumblethink.com slash Spotify, you'll be able to go right there to the Jumble Think page on that platform and click the subscribe button. Also, did you know that Google just launched a new podcast app. If you're using that, you can find the JumbleThink podcast there too. Now let's learn a little bit more about today's guest, Tom Poland. Uh, my name is Tom Poland. The business name is Leadsology, and my role of the business is I'm chief leadsologist. Uh, what I do and my business does is we implement lead generation systems for professionals who offer service advice or software. The big idea started in 2008 when I really looked at the needs of the market and for the first time truly understood that lead generation was the biggest need for solopreneurs and entrepreneurs. One story that tells how I find fulfillment, significance, and purpose of what I do is having presented a keynote address and having a woman come up to me afterwards and take me by the hand and look me in the eyes and thank me and saying, I just wanted to come up and make a point of thanking you for giving me my husband back. And the conversation around that was around working with her husband so that the business was far more profitable, but that he was also spending a lot more time at home. Why what I do actually matters is that I believe that we've all got inside us, in our DNA somewhere, this deep desire, other than psychopaths probably, but most of us, a deep desire to make the world a better place. And once we have some security around our basic needs, such as food and shelter, um, that's where we seem to move to is, 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 yes, money's important, of course it's important, but it's a very hollow feeling if all you're doing is making money without helping people. So I think that's what matters to me. And I think it's very significant because of all sorts of reasons. I like to sleep well at night. I like to feel good about myself. And that's part of what I mean by it's wired into our DNA. Uh, karma is important to me. The concept of reaping what we sow. I have one eye on that <laughs> and one eye on my daily needs, I suppose, and goals. But uh, that's extraordinarily significant. One challenge I'm currently working on to overcome in my own business is the next level of scalability. And there's always another level of scalability. So in the past, I've franchised and licensed businesses internationally and done well from that, enjoyed the challenge and also the rewards that come with that, doing that successfully. But right now, I am have a terrific business model. The leads flow in every single week. I have clients that are making solid progress and getting great results. But I want to scale that. And I'm inspired by... Uh, people like Muhammad Yunus, who's the founder of Garmin Bank, the micro credit facility lenders, uh, and the level of scalability that he's brought to a very simple business. So I'm scratching my head currently and figure out how I can make the world a better place, but on a, a much bigger scale. The next big goal I have for my business uh, is I want to crack the $2 million revenue barrier 
and I want to help another thousand business owners establish quality and effective lead generation systems into their businesses because that is oxygen for their business. That's what allows their businesses to not only survive but actually thrive. In a moment, we'll be back with Tom Poland as we go deeper into the conversation about Leadsology and what he is creating. You have big ideas and dreams, but you don't know how to start. Maybe you feel isolated and alone. Maybe you don't feel like you're getting support from your family or friends. Well, the JumbleThink team is here to help. We would love to be your partner on the journey of chasing your big idea and seeing it come into reality. Swing on over to jumblethink.com slash help me. That's jumblethink.com slash help me to learn more about how we can help you on the journey of taking your idea from an idea and making it a reality. Now let's dive into the conversation we had with Tom Pollan. My guest today is Tom Poland. Tom, thanks so much for taking time to be on the podcast. Oh, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be here. I love the fact that here we are online uh, talking and getting to have you on the podcast, and we're on opposite sides of the world. It's it's pretty crazy what we can do nowadays with communication and being able to use uh, our skill sets like you do at a global level. So. Can you share a little bit about how having this global voice, having, being able to share your message with the, the world has really impacted what you do and how you do it? Well, I think, first of all, thanks to the internet, it's given me the sort of scalability that I could have only have dreamed of 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, that's the first thing. So the scalability, and by that I mean to be able to serve more people, but in relatively speaking, less time per person. That sort of scalability is, is to me, extraordinarily exciting. I can sit here on the sand, in our house, on the sand next to the beach, a little castaways beach in Queensland, Australia, and I can serve clients from London, Madrid, Berlin, New York, Dallas, uh, Los Angeles, Sydney, Melbourne, uh, and, and the richness and diversity of serving so many clients in such diverse markets, I find incredibly rewarding and fulfilling. It's really cool because... Uh, you, what you do, you have the freedom to do it what, wherever you do it from, whenever you want to do it, and with whoever you want to do it. And and in that freedom, I think, you know, as we talked before uh, we jumped onto the interview, one of the things that you talked about was building a business uh, on what you should versus what you want to do and how business executives, startup founders, how uh, entrepreneurs really struggle with that should versus want. Can you share a little bit about that dilemma and absolutely how that looks for us? Absolutely. Uh, look, my, my thing is in lead generation, and I can explain it in the context of lead generation because that's, you know, yeah. that's my specialty, but it really applies to disciplines right across businesses. My fundamental premise is this. We wake up every single day and we do what we want to do okay every now and then we wake up and we do what we should do but we never do what we should do consistently okay and frankly we don't do it particularly well because we don't do it often enough but every single day we wake up and we do what we want to do so i'll explain that in terms of lead generation just uh, for a, an example but as i said it has much broader application, both to management and uh, leadership and all sorts of different disciplines within a business. So let's take a look at lead generation. And I talk about dogs and cats. My clients are either dogs and cats. Almost all of them are metaphorically speaking a dog. Uh, we know a dog barks and cats meow. So metaphorically speaking, dogs are, well, let, let's translate this uh, as opposed to the real world. You know, dogs, uh, metaphorically speaking, are big picture people. They're people persons you know yeah. um yeah. we like to meet people we like to develop services we get excited about new opportunities cats on the other hand better in this little metaphor are routine detail people they like to follow systems <laughs> they like to uh, if you like if it's a digital world they actually prefer to flip burgers at mcdonald's than yeah. digitally speaking in other words to follow a system point to point step by step paint by numbers join the dots now when a dog tries to meow it sounds pretty ugly. Yeah. So if I wake up in the morning and think, okay, I need to find people on LinkedIn. I need to connect with them. I need to uh, sort of do a report and get the profile sorted out and do a list and go through them methodically and copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. Then that's something that I should do. 
but it's not something that I want to do. So I'll wake up every single morning, as I said, and I'll do the things that I want to do. And what I want to do really is actually meet with people and talk about leadsology, talk about my business and see if they have an interest in that. So if I can set up my business, so that's all I do is I just show up and talk about what I do and talk to people who are interested in what I do, then wouldn't that be kind of like a heaven <laughs> for the entrepreneur? Yeah. Cause, because the dog's barking and the dog's not trying to meow. In other words, I'm not doing the detail, the routine with persistence because I don't want to do that. Right. So right. if you look at just marketing and then have a look at the things you truly want to do, that if you were going, let's put it like this, if you were going to go to work on, a, on any given day, what would you want to be doing? Would you be want to be doing five-year cash flow forecasts and getting into the fight of most entrepreneurs, their eyes glaze over at that thought? Right, right. Or would you right. just want to go to have a set of meetings that you'd predetermined when you wanted to have them and who you wanted to meet with to talk about what you do? And you wanted someone else to do all the detail and the, the plodding, methodical, persistent work of getting the right people to those meetings so you could talk. Well, you would answer, of course you would. I mean, why would you want to? Because and that's, so if you're a dog, bark. <laughs> and if you cat me out, do the things, because that's God's gift to you. That's your DNA. That's right. your evolution, whatever, however we want to term this. This is what you were born to do. You were born to do those things that you want to do. That's your natural inclination. Don't try, try and strengthen your weaknesses. Don't try and discipline yourself to do the things that you don't want to do because you will not do them regularly. I'm 62 years old, and I've been having a crack at this now for over 40 years. And I can tell you, we always do the things we want to do, and we only sometimes do the things that we should do. Well, what it sounds like you're saying is that it isn't necessarily just about doing the things that you should be doing, because maybe you should be doing the things you want to be doing, but what you should be doing is being aware of the should and building other people into the team or outsourcing that to make the strengths so that when you focus on uh, a company as the holistic standpoint, all of those bases are covered, but you're doing what you excel in and letting other people do what they excel in. Let the cats be cats, dogs be dogs, but be aware. hundred percent correct. If, you know, I have contractors in Pakistan, uh, India, Bangladesh, the Philippines, uh, the USA, mm, the UK, the odd one in Eastern Europe. And with uh, contractors now and the ability to be able to outsource, let me, let me put it like this. With my team of contractors, if I could physically line them all up in a row and stand at one end and look into the ears of the first person, I should not see daylight at the end of that row of people. <laughs> right. They should all have something that they do exceptionally well, that they are naturally good at, that they wake up in the morning and want to do. And I should have each of those contractors in that specific role, waking up in the morning doing what they actually want to do. Because that's when you turbocharge a business. And that's when professional fulfillment and personal joy kicks in, because people are all doing what they want to do. And I'm not saying that the things that we, quote unquote, should be doing uh, should be left undone. I'm just saying that they should be done by the person who naturally wants to do those things. Well, so often we build teams around us of people that are like us because it's easier to not deal with the conflict or, you know, everyone's going to be on board. But sounds like by having that diverse skill set, but also that diverse voice, you're building a stronger team that that helps your business grow beyond your own vision, but also bring in the voices and opinions and the strengths of others to make it even st stronger. But most definitely. And it's not that, we, you know, anyone would suggest that the business should be run by a committee, but certainly it's the leader's prerogative to figure out the strategic direction. But within that context, yeah. we'd be silly not to listen to the voices of the people that are actually doing the work at the coalface, so to speak, and to, um, to get the incremental improvements and the suggestions and to listen carefully but but still, it's the prerogative of leadership, as I said, to, to A, to get those people on board, and B, to get them on board aligned with the predetermined strategy. Well, I, I, this brings me to something that I think is uh, right in your wheelhouse. It's obviously what you do, and I want to dive into the world of lead generation. For me, uh, you know, you look at so many different channels to generate leads from. 
you've got your website, you've got social media, you've got traditional media. And, and, and at the simplest level, lead generation is the action or process of identifying and cultivating potential customers for a business, uh, business's product and services. But your viewpoint on what lead generation looks like, where you start in that journey of lead generation and how you make it work well for you is vastly different than I think the approach of a lot of people uh, approaching how to generate leads. So let's talk about lead generation and how you define it and then how you incorporate the right channels uh, to support what you're doing. Okay. Well, let's, let's start, I guess, start from the beginning. You know, what, what's, what's the promise? What am I suggesting is possible? And what that looks like is that the owner of the business, probably the person listening to this podcast, wakes up on a Monday morning and they open up their calendar while they're having a coffee and they're sipping their coffee and they look at their week and they smile as they see a lot of bookings that have come in, yeah. keyword in, yeah, uh, from highly qualified prospects who want to know more about working with, with you know, with the listener to this podcast. And those the bookings have been made proactively by individuals who are excited about the opportunity to learn more about what you do. Uh, they know your fee range already. So when they do speak with you, there's no surprise there. Yeah, um, They've agreed that they can afford to work with you. And they regard you really probably not so much as one of their very best options, but but probably as their only valid option. So that's that's the scenario, and we could work backwards from there. So how does that happen? I, I guess is is possibly the, the big question. How do you how do you get to the point where you wake up every Monday morning, you see these bookings from people who are highly qualified, and that's Michael. That's what I call a lead. Yeah. Uh, everything else is a, is a suspect or a prospect, but these are leads. Leads are not people who register for a webinar. Leads are not people who, in my world at least, who opt in for from a Facebook ad to say some sort of guide or series of, of, of videos. They're all prospects or suspects. But that's that to me, that's a highly qualified lead. Because you you know, you really in any sort of mature business, any sort of business that is doing well, the person who is in charge of sales should not be trying to milk mice. Yeah. You, you don't want to be meeting with people who are broke or who aren't a fit. And, you know, the metaphor of milking mice is an apt one because it's very hard to get milk out of a mouse, like it's very hard to get money out of a, a client who, a prospective client who doesn't have it. And it's also very, you know, painful for the mouse and frustrating for you. So let's stop milking mice. Let's make sure that everyone that wants to speak with you about becoming a client is highly qualified and that we know, before, and they know that they can afford to work with you. I love that you use the term highly qualified because I think so often when you get referrals or leads from whatever source that is, often you're you're sifting through uh, this pool of people. You go, well, that's a bad potential customer. That's a bad uh, fit for us. Right. And we spend so much time sifting through uh, this big pool of potential only to find the the diamonds in the rough because we've had to search for them. How can we really start identifying our perfect customer, our perfect client, and begin to speak so that they're the people you're attracting and you're you're eliminating the others through how you communicate? Well, it's it's a terrific question. <laughs> how you identify them really is actually the simplest part of the whole process because okay. gen well, generally you know what they look like. I mean, my clients, for example, are professionals marketing services, advice, or software. They don't have a retail store. They don't have a manufacturing plant. They don't, they're don't. not multi-level marketers. They have a service. So they're management consultants, uh, coaches of some description, perhaps, uh, accountants, architects. They all have, They all market their intellectual property. So so that's not difficult. Um, yeah. The trickier part, I mean, finding people is actually incredibly easy. It's the easiest, it's the easiest part of the whole equation is finding people. The tricky part is finding the right people yeah. And then having them immersed in an experience that shifts their mind from not knowing you at all to wanting to work with you. That's the tricky part. Okay. Because okay. having people find my website is relatively easy. Uh, me finding people, perhaps on LinkedIn or Google search, that's pretty easy as well. But taking them from not knowing a person's brand to believing that brand or that service or that provider is one of the very best options, if not their only valid option. That's the tricky part, and that's what I call the lead zoology persuasion sequence. So every single – let me answer the question like this perhaps. It is 
incredibly important that we focus on finding the right people. But as I said, okay. that's not particularly difficult. That is incredibly yeah. important. Yeah. Because if you put the wrong, if you put the right uh, marketing message or the right uh, product value proposition or the right, I could call it a pot of gold. You, know, you put that in front of a million people who are completely disinterested in what you do because they're just not in your market. It's a complete waste of time. So, so we understand that profiling and targeting the right demographic and psychographic is critically important. But after that, it's a numbers game. After that, and people don't want to hear this perhaps, but after that, it's a numbers game. <laughs> okay. Once we've profiled we're the right person, then we want volume yeah. because without that volume, we're not going to get enough people too. And the reason we need the volume is because everyone should have filters set up yeah. to filter out the people who can't afford what you do, uh, who, for whom the timing is not quite right, or for whom, you know, whatever. It's just they're just not the mice, you know, and you don't want to try milking mice. So, for example, and, and I know I need to put some flesh on these bones so people understand what on earth I'm talking about. So, for example, all of my clients have contractors. Okay. whose job it is to data mine and to identify potential ideal clients. Yeah, They have a digital equivalent, uh, as I said before, of flipping burgers at McDonald's, so they can easily find people who fit the profile. Uh, we don't know. At this point, they're still suspects at the very best prospects, but we don't know if they have an interest. But they do have the profile of the person who's likely to be an ideal client. Then they have a process to contact and engage those people, at which point many people are filtered out. Approximately 97.5% are filtered out, right? Yeah. So we've started with 100 suspects, and now we're down to around 2.5 prospects. Okay. And once we've filtered out the 97.5%, and we've got the 2.5% that are left, and these might have come from LinkedIn or they might have come from other people's networks, which if we have time, we can talk about that because that's yeah. the source of millions of dollars of revenue, other people's networks. Um, once we've got that, then we invite them to an experience. And that experience could be a small uh, video conference. It could be a webinar. It could be a series of online videos. But we invite them to an experience through which uh, we, we, we put, lead them through a, a, what I call the persuasion sequence. And that persuasion sequence is designed for the 2.5% that have an interest in your subject matter. And it walks them through 10 steps at the end of which, if they are the right person, they will then reach out and book a time to talk with you about becoming a client. So the 10 steps include things like, why listen to me? Yeah. You know, if you're going to come to my little video conference or my webinar or buy my book or do my multiple day challenge, why would you do that? So <laughs> that's a really great question. Why yeah. listen to me? It needs to be yeah. answered. Uh, the next question is, well, what's the promise? And I, I articulated my promise, which is waking up Monday morning, having a look at your calendar, seeing inbound bookings from high-quality uh, leads who want, who want to know more about working with you. So what's your promise? And what's the problem you solve? What are the symptoms of those problems? So these are all steps that we walk people through because the problem and the symptoms are very important because we want the person who is experiencing this webinar, boardroom briefing, book, whatever it happens to be, we want them to know that they're in the right place and this is meant for them. And we want to build relatability. And then we go on and describe the mistakes that they have made in trying to solve the problem. And we tell them why they're mistakes. And in the process, we validly, we, with, we validate, well, sorry, I should say, let me rephrase this. We ethically and in a valid way, rationally eliminate most of their other options. Okay. And then we go on to prove it. And, and we give them proof that what we do actually works very well. And then we take away every major obstacle in their mind from reaching out that stops them from reaching out to book a time to talk. Okay. And obstacles such as, well, am I going to waste money on this? Am I going to waste time on this? <laughs> All of those elephants in the room has to have to be spoken to. Right. So how, how, do I, how do I know that you really are genuine? How do I know I'm not going to burn money like I have in the past when I've invested with other people like you? Yeah. Because <laughs> it's no good just saying to people that they can trust you. You've got to demonstrate it. Yeah. It's so good. You are talking about really crafting a, a specialized message, a marketing message, but so many businesses, so many entrepreneurs are really just putting content out and they're not mm. being really effective with their message. If I want to be effective in growing in uh, a pool of people coming to me that are, are, are so focused and mm. exactly my perfect customer, how can I really market 
uh, from an effective message? How can I use that effective right. message as a marketing tool instead of just putting stuff out there? Right. And it's look, it's a terrific question. And in fact, you know, the questions you're asking me, uh, you're asking me is, um, it makes me feel that the interview should probably be the other way around because you obviously know a lot about marketing. Um, out, let me answer the question by this out, out the back, you know, we live on the sand here next to the beach and out the back, we've got kind of like a park for a backyard. It's, it's quite big. We've got beehives. I've got a dog here as well, Monty, my little border collie, my marketing wonder dog, Monty. And so we've got his dinner bowl out back and we've got beehives and I can go in out the back and I can get the best bunch of flowers, the most beautiful bunch of flowers and put it in Monty's dinner bowl. Okay. And he's going to look at me with those puppy dog eyes with his ears are going to, he's going to be like, are you, have you got nuts? You know, I'm not going to eat this stuff. These are flowers. Yeah. But if I put them in front of the beehive, we've got bees all over the flowers. So we have to match the marketing asset to the audience. Right. Publishing articles is virtually a waste of time. Uh, going onto LinkedIn and building or building a Facebook group, virtually a waste of time. Is it? Yeah. A, now I do these things, but I only do these things not to generate leads, but to keep my brand in people's brain until they're ready to buy. Right. It's a cultivating tool, not a, a closing tool. That's exactly, that's exactly right. You're not going to generate new clients by posting articles to LinkedIn. Sure, right. even a blind squirrel will find an acorn in a forest once in a while, but it's not sustainable or predictable. Right. What we need to do is understand that we don't want to reach everyone. Right. We only want to reach the 2.5% that are immediately seeking a solution to the problem with which we can help them. Okay. That's where the smart money is. That's where efficiency is, that's where effectiveness is, and that's where a very significant return on investment is. So the, you have to look at it and you say, well, what sort of, you know, how, how do I metaphorically, how do I put steak in the dinner bowl? Because there's no, when you put steak in Monty's dinner bowl, he, he, there's no selling required. Right. You know, the, the whole, I am the world's lousiest salesperson, <laughs> partly because, you know, I'm kind of like the Kiwi who didn't need to fly, he lost his wings. Right. I, I used to be a salesperson in, in a previous life about 37 years ago. But with good marketing, you don't need selling. Okay. I mean, you literally don't need to sell anyone yeah. you, because they're so highly qualified. By the time they get to speak with you, they want to work with you and they know what you charge. So it's a simple conversation between adults to confirm that there's a fit. So we've got to get the right assets. And the right assets mean that if someone is not prepared to spend at least 20 minutes, preferably 45 minutes with uh, your brand checking you out, then they're no more than a suspect. Right. At that point, they are a prospect. They say, well, look, I, you know, Tom's running this boardroom briefing. It looks like it's going to run for 35 minutes. It's on lead generation. I need leads. I will commit to registering for that meeting, and I will show up to the meeting, and I will sit through the meeting, provided it's not as boring as batshit, pardon me, but, but I, I will sit through that meeting because I have put my hand up as one of the 2.5% that says I'm actually very interested in lead gen. Okay. But I'm still skeptical, but I'm <laughs> open-minded. And it's that 25, 35, 45 minutes where I have the opportunity to lead people through that persuasion sequence I mentioned before. Yeah, yeah. So they are the people that we want to get in front of. And we want to have a meaningful filter, not a blog post, not, you know, I, I look, I do seven-minute podcasts, but not a seven-minute podcast. They, as you mentioned before, that's for nurturing. That's for keeping the brand and the brain clearly to buy. We want to supplement that by having a direct response experience with someone at the end of which is, would you like to book a time to speak about becoming a client? Okay. Not some sort of complimentary strategy session, which we all know is just a sales ambush dressed up <laughs> as something that's added value. Right. And which every, everyone on their website says, you know, book your, how exciting, book your free complimentary strategy session. That's BS. Yeah. We know we all know that you just want more clients and it's a sales trap. Right. So let's just let's just be authentic and be genuine and say, hey, look, if you got to the end of this five-day lead generation challenge or you've sat through this 35-minute presentation and you want to see if what I've got is a fit, then let's talk. Okay. Two adults having a conversation okay. about whether I've got something here that's going to be good for you. Yeah. Simple, right? Yeah. Okay, so – You've got them into your 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 clutches. You've filtered out all of the messages <laughs> that don't matter, uh, and you've really focused. You got that two percent. You've nailed it, and they're coming in. So many people butcher the close of taking a lead and making them a client, and 
That's true. That really, really well and doing it in such a way that you're going back, you're confirming that they're a good uh, lead, that you're confirming that they're who you want and you're who they need. What do we really need to be doing in that end process of leads to making uh, what we're doing successful in that lead generation process? Well, like I said before, I'm the world's lousiest salesperson. So <laughs> if it's a conversion conversation, I'm not the guy you should speak to because right. I only want to speak to people who actually want to work with me yeah. and I'm just validating whether I can help them or not. Yeah. You know, the first question I always ask people is, what's the magic? What is it that you do that can transform someone's businesses or someone's lives? Because in one way or another, I need to know that they've got something I can market. If it's a commodity thing, if it's boring, if it doesn't make any difference, I got nothing I can market. So what's the magic? Um, that that sort of inherent in that, Michael, is the is a a really important concept, which is they need to prove to me that I can help them. Okay. Not the other way around. I I need to know if I can help them. Um, now I I I do have more of an answer for you than just that. But the emotional detachment uh, of needing that person as a client, regardless of what your bank account book looks like, that emotional detachment of needing that client is absolutely critical because the moment someone senses that you're in need and that you're trying to close them, that's the moment when resistance comes up. Mm. If If you can have an honest conversation with someone that says, look, I need to ask you some questions to make sure that what I've got here is going to be helpful to you because I don't want to take you on as a client if what I'm going to do is only produce mediocre results for you because you've you've done that before, right? You've right. paid people money and it hasn't worked out so well. So so let's have that conversation. Of course, you can ask me questions about my services, et cetera. Before people get to talk with me, uh, they've been through the experience of a webinar or a video conference or a multi challenge or they've read my book. They've gone to a web page. They've had tick boxes saying, yes, I understand what your fees are. Yes, I understand that when we meet, it's not going to be a free coaching consultation. It's not going to be a sales trap either. And yes, I understand that if I work with you, then you'll work with me, Tom, for the first month without me paying a cent, which is part of what I do. And, and Michael, that's a part of what we want to take away all the obstacles from people booking your time to talk with us or working with us. And one of the obstacles is they've paid money to people like you in the past and they've been burnt. So to answer that, I say, well, you know, don't trust me. Mm. So what do you mean? I, you know, I'm going to work with you. I got to trust you, right? (laughs) I say, well, let me ask you this. Have you, have you heard people before? It says, you know, trust me, give me your money and I'll give you, I'll show you how to generate some leads. Uh, yeah, they say. I said, well, how did it work out for you? He said, well, I kind of lost money, you know. Three months later, I only had a lighter bank account balance to show for it, and I implemented all this stuff, but it really didn't make any difference. Right. So when people have said, trust me, give me your money, that hasn't really worked for you, right? No, it hasn't. It has not worked on multiple occasions. Okay, so let's stop doing that, okay, because that doesn't work. Why don't we do it this way? Why don't I trust you to pay me after the first month if you believe it's one of the best business decisions you've ever made. Yeah. I will work with you. I'll meet with you every week. I'll give you full access to everything. So so that's what we've got to do now to mix it up because there are so many BS artists out there and so many hype merchants out there. So, so getting back to your question of the conversion process, all of those – uh, and, and before they speak with you, they get you know they book a time to speak with you, having agreed that they can afford you, and all those other things I just mentioned. So by the time they get to see you, they know what the features and benefits are of working with you because they've they've read that web page, they've booked the time, they've agreed. So it's really just a validation process. And you know, geez, I mean, uh, you know, I have programs that range from two thousand dollars a year to twenty five thousand dollars a month. Right. And at that point, it's it's a simple conversation and my conversion rate is 70% because all the filters have been put into place prior to that person speaking with me. The questions have been answered, 90% of them at least, and they're comfortable with the basic value proposition that I'm offering. That's effective marketing. I'm going to back up here a little bit and ask probably a very unfair question, so I apologize for that. Um, They're my favorites. (laughs) So let's say I'm a business owner. Um, I've started a business and I have a killer product or an amazing service, uh, but I just 
am, I'm not seeing the leads that mm. I'm looking to get. Mm. What are the first steps I need to be taking right now to reevaluate what's going on yeah. so that I can really make the pivot and the transition into something that brings value? Okay. Well, well, for starter, there's only one or two things that are wrong, but we can validate that. Okay. I'll show you how to tell you how to validate that in a moment. Yeah. Um, the two things that one of the two things that are wrong is either it's the wrong marketing message or it's in front of the wrong person. Okay. So if you're trying to get people to an event and it's not happening, it's either the wrong message or it's in front of the offers in front of the wrong people or both. Now, how, how you validate that is you do an exercise called lost quotes. All right. So you have someone, not you, someone but who's independent, might be a $5 an hour contractor from Upwork, I don't know, but you have someone who's not you, contact those people and say, hey, you know, uh, my boss, you know, Tom uh, had invited you to this uh, session and we noticed that it wasn't of interest to you. We're just doing a bit of market research. Would you be able to let us know uh, what would have to have happened, these are the key words, in order for you to actually want to attend that event? Yeah. So- this is the lost quotes exercise and it's a gold mine and people don't want to hear the answers because basically people are saying you need to change. You need to improve something. <laughs> and our unconscious and like that. Right. But a quick story. Um, a marketing colleague of mine, Alan uh, was, had a, a, you know, second cousin's wife's husband sort of thing who had a kitchen manufacturing business and it was, it was a disaster You know, he just wasn't making any sales. And he yeah. got as a favor, the, you know, the kitchen manufacturer was broke. So as a favor, Alan went in to try and help him with this marketing. And he said to him, look, um, you know, out of every hundred quotes, how many of you actually getting? He said, well, we're getting, we're getting three out of every hundred quotes. And, and at top of the guy, he knew his numbers. And Alan said to him, so, well, tell me, what, what, why aren't the other 97 out of every hundred, why aren't they buying? Yeah. And the guy looked at him and says, how should I know? I'm too busy doing quotes. <laughs> and so the gold is in talking to the 97 people and saying, what would have to have happened in order for you to go ahead with this quote? Just ask perhaps the he needed a guarantee. Yeah, perhaps he wasn't clear yeah. in exactly what the kitchen was going to look like. Maybe they needed 3D models. Maybe I don't know what they I don't know what the answers are. But the 97 out of 100, they definitely knew what the answers were. So so often it's just ask. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it's okay if you ask yourself, but it's better if you can have someone independent who asks, who assures that person that their answers will be, be kept anonymous. Yeah. Uh, because people will tend to tell you what they think you want to hear. In other words, they'll be nice to you, right? but they'll be absolutely brutal with someone <laughs> if they don't think you're going to be able to identify the source. Yeah, absolutely. So much we could talk about lead generation and everything like that. I want to take a moment and just uh, talk about a little bit of your own entrepreneurial journey because you've been doing this business thing uh, since you were 24, it's something that you've worked at for a yeah. long time. Tell us a little bit about that journey of saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to create my own path versus going the traditional way of finding a job and just being in the workforce. Well, I suppose to be, <laughs> to be fair, initially it was motivated by making a buck a load of money. You know, when I, when I was 24, yeah. and I was working as a, a sales rep and I had a company car and all that sort of stuff. It was nice, but I could see there was a clear cap. On, on my potential to earn. Right. And as a young man, right. recently married and about to have a family and wanting to get a home, I didn't see how I was going to be able to support my family in the way I want to support them and have, live in the sort of place just by, you know, having my little company car and it was, it was a nice little job, you <laughs> right. know. And so, so I, and the other thing was, I knew one day that I'd be an old person. I'd be sitting maybe on the porch in a rocking chair. And this was the greatest motivator to me, I have to say, that I didn't want to have a regret when I was sitting on that rocking chair. I didn't want to look back and think, geez, you know, when I was 24, I had that, I had the opportunity to start my own business and I, I kind of wimped out, I chickened out. I didn't want to have that regret. I had something deep inside of me that was prepared to take the risk. And my, oh my, what a roller coaster journey that one's been. But I'm so glad I did because when lose or draw, I'm going to be able to sit on that rocking chair and say, I gave that a fair crack of the whip. That's so, so good. I absolutely love that. I I love to hear people's motivation when they get into it. And, and uh, you know, it encourages me. I know it encourages others. So thanks for sharing that. As we wrap up this segment, I want to make sure that people know 
how they can find you, how they can find your book, because uh, you've got amazing resources that people can utilize and also getting in touch with you about the services that you have to take their lead generation process to the next level and really uh, tune it to be something really powerful for their business. So tell us how people can connect with you, how they can find you and begin to learn all of the amazing insights that you've shared today at a deeper level. Thanks, Michael. Well, the easy, the simplest place to go is bookachatwithtom.com, so www.bookachatwithtom.com. If people really want to get uh, serious about embedding what is virtually automated lead generation systems of high-quality inbound leads every week, that's the best place to go. The other place where there's a bunch of free stuff that you've alluded to is my main website, leadsology.guru, and I apologize for the .guru, but .com was taken. <laughs> <laughs> leads. Leadsology, L-E-A-D-S, ology guru, uh, and there's a free stuff tab there. Webinars, uh, samples, books, templates, guides, models, you name it, it's there. So that are probably the two best resources that I could direct people to. We'll include those links uh, in our episode notes, and we'll be right back with Tom Poland and our rapid fire questions. You have big ideas and dreams, but you don't know how to make them a reality. Well, the JumbleThink team has worked with hundreds of individuals and businesses to turn those ideas and dreams into reality, and we want to help you. Swing on over to jumblethink.com slash help me to learn how we can help you in the process of turning ideas into dreams. Again, that's jumblethink.com slash help me. Let's start the conversation and see how we can help you turn dreams and ideas into reality. Now let's join our rapid fire questions with Tom Poland. We're back with Tom and Rapid Fire Questions. Tom, you ready for some Rapid Fire Questions? I love this sort of thing. Uh, I'm excited for it. It's going to be a lot of fun. The first question is, what is one tip you'd give someone with a big idea or dream and they don't know where to start? I would say to them the complete opposite of what most advice they're going to get. Okay. Uh, most advice would be find a mentor, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I'd say go within. Okay. I would go within and listen to that quiet, still voice mm. because that will tell you where you need to go next. And I've found that the power of questions, self-questions are absolutely extraordinary. If you get some clarity around what the question is, for example, I've got this big dream, what's the next step? And just sit with that question, then over a process of 24 to 48 to 72 hours, the answer will come and it will be clear. Mm. In other words, tap into your intuition, but that's how you do it. So good. What is one change you'd like to see in the world? I would like to see more opportunity for people to start their own business. Okay. I'm a big fan of Muhammad Yunus. He wrote the book, uh, A World of Three Zeros. Right. Uh, and he points out the inequality, the financial inequality. Eight people in the world have 50% of the wealth. Yeah. Eight people. <laughs> the world is falling to bits from an environmental point of view. Uh, greed is rampant. And I, if I had a magic wand, that's what I'd be changing. What do you want your legacy to be? I want my legacy to be that is a guy who helped his little corner of the world to have better businesses and through that, mm -hmm. better lives. Yeah, so good. Where do you find inspiration? I find my inspiration in books and in podcasts <laughs> like this okay. one ah. with people that, that have a dream and that are not, you know, just have altruism as this exterior fake co you know, cloak, but yeah. who actually do care. Uh, yeah. And that's, you know, I'm a big fan of people like Bill Gates, who has reached a level of, of maturity and philanthropy and uh, Muhammad Yunus and so on, particularly guys like Muhammad Yunus, who has not done, you know, has, has not um, sought to gain financially, personally, for, is genuinely making the world a better place without, yeah. well, he's, he's the mother Teresa of the commercial world in my, in my view. You, you mentioned that books are a place that you find inspiration. What's one book you think every dreamer or entrepreneur should read and why? Richard Koch, uh, The 80-20 Principle. Okay. Because Richard's Richard's book, The 80-20 Principle, will blow your mind about the potential of your life, not just in business, but in your personal life as well. And he lays out not just the principles, the concepts which are proven, but he also lays out specific action questions for every area of your life. And that is the my all-time favorite book. It has been for the last 23 years, and it very likely will be for the next 23 years. What is one tool that is significant for the success of your business? Pipe Drive. Okay. Pipedrive.com. What is Tracks it? my biggest – well, it's, it's a very simple online tool that tracks in visual or graphic terms 
uh, my my partners, my OPN partners, other people's networks partners. So these are the big opportunities for me. And I want to make sure that none of those opportunities fall between the cracks. So I use Pipe Drive uh, to track those and to remind me what needs to happen next. Very cool. What's one habit you find helpful in your life as an entrepreneur? Well, the, the best habit is actually outsourcing uh, everything that looks like it needs a meow. <laughs> <Love> that. <laughs> and I've done this for a long time, but I'm just getting better and better at it. So uh, that, that's the biggest habit is, is not to do things, but to not do things, okay. to not to do the things that I wasn't born to do. Yeah. How do you start and finish your day? I start the day by jumping in the swimming pool, okay. whether it's summer, winter, uh, fall, whatever it is, uh, because I'm very slow to wake up. I'm like Darth Vader, you know, ascending from the depths of hell. Don't talk to me until I've jumped in the pool and had coffee. Yeah. Uh, finish the day. I always finish the day reading something. It's inspirational and fall, it, almost falling asleep reading a book. Wow. That's a lot of fun. If you weren't doing what you're doing today, what do you think you'd be doing? Well, I don't know how if I take the big picture or little picture, but if I didn't have a day of work today, I'd be playing tennis. Okay. And if I wanted, wasn't doing lead generation, then I'd be helping couples with their relationships. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. Our final rapid fire question is, what is one dream you're still willing to fulfill in your own life? The dream I want to fulfill in my own life is to spend more and more time with my grandchildren. Mm. That's, that's an incredible dream. Love it. As we wrap up today's episode, I want to leave you with our final thought. What would you like to share with us today? The most important thought that I could, I think I could leave with anyone is to back yourself, mm. to believe in yourself, okay. to never abdicate the final decisions for anything in your life, be it business. You are the master of your own destiny. Step up to that uh, because that's going to be the source of your fulfillment and also is going to be what leads the legacy. Back yourself. Tom, it's been a lot of fun having you on the podcast. Thanks for taking time out, sharing your story, and giving us so many amazing insights into the world of lead generation. Michael, I want to thank you for one of the best interviews of my whole life. It's been fascinating. Once again, I want to thank today's guest, Tom Poland, for taking time out, sharing his story, and giving us so many powerful insights into the world of lead generation. You can find links to Tom and how you can connect with him in the episode notes. I want to thank you for tuning into today's episode. It means the world to me that you would listen to me and our amazing guests. As we leave today's episode, I want to encourage you, get out there and chase those big ideas and dreams. Take a step, whether it's big or small, it doesn't matter, but take a step today to move that big idea and dream forward and change the world around you. Thanks again for tuning in. Until next time, chase those big dreams and change the world around you. Les mères de famille, les enfants, peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois. Lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.